My name is Dr. Heidi Keeler, Director of Educational Design at Beacon and faculty at the UNMC College of Nursing. I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. I'd like to thank you all for joining our webinar this evening. This is the first of a six-part series, and so we are so excited to be able to host this for you. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, how this series came about in a minute, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of you who are a part of the start of something that will be so beneficial for nursing in our state. This webinar will be interactive with polls and an extended time for questioning after the first hour. Please feel free to type in questions, and we will most certainly have time to address these towards the end. Although we do encourage questions on specific cases, please remember to refrain from divulging personal information about those involved. We will be asking polling questions, and when this occurs, a blue box will pop up on your screen. Please use your cursor to select your answer. We will allow some time for listeners to respond, and then we'll remove the box after the poll closes. I also encourage you to take part in our Twitter conversation, which is Beacon for Nurses. That's hashtag B-H-E-C-N, the, the number four, N-U-R-S-E-S. -E Mary, can you go to slide two, please? The webinar will award 1.5 ANCC contact hours for participation in the entire presentation. Neither speaker today has anything to disclose, and you will receive more information about how to claim your contact hours at the end of this presentation. Pictured on the slide, you see both of our main speakers for today. But before we begin the content portion of the webinar, I'd like to introduce Amy Holmes, Education and Outreach Coordinator at Beacon. Amy is a lawyer and has much experience with policy and legislation affecting behavioral health care in Nebraska. Amy, when you're ready. Thank you, Heidi, and thanks to our speakers and everybody that's um, on and ready to watch this great webinar. We're excited to have um, our speakers kicking off this six-part series, and I know that we'll be talking a little bit more about that and about how we came to bring this group of people together for this wonderful um, event. We hope that it's going to help you all with your networking with one another, and uh, we hope that it's going to raise awareness not only about um, behavioral health and all of the, the related topics, but about um, behavioral health as a profession. And for those of you that are not already specializing in psych or uh, working in a behavioral health care setting, we hope that um, some of this may inspire you to learn more about the careers that are available and all the opportunities across the state. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule because we know all of you have very little time to spare, and we're glad that uh, we get to spend a little bit of time with you this evening. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Beacon. Uh, as Heidi mentioned, I'm the Education and Outreach uh, Coordinator for Beacon. We've only been around for five years. The legislature created our organization in 2009, and we were specifically designed to address the workforce shortage in Nebraska. So the behavioral health professions, psychiatry, psychology, psychiatric nursing, uh, nurse practitioners. We also work with um, bachelor's level folks, those with associate's degrees, community health workers, peer support professionals, so the entire spectrum of the behavioral health workforce. And we hoped to address the shortage by providing training, uh, providing education, continuing education like what we have here tonight, and also by recruiting folks into the profession. So young people, students, both high school and college, and then existing professionals that may be willing, like I said, to consider a specialty. So we have all kinds of things going on. We, we encourage you to take a look at our website. We have free trainings available outside of this series that we're talking about today. And we have all other kinds of opportunities for those of you that may be willing to act as a mentor or preceptor for students that are um, still in school and entering the field. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Thank you. So that's me there and then Heidi. And we do encourage you to get in contact with us if you have any questions about this webinar, about Beacon in general. We'd love to talk with you more about it. 
We've been working uh, with various professions um, since we were started in 2009, but we have to say that we really want to increase our focus in the nursing area. Uh, there are um, good programs in place with Beacon for psychiatry. Uh, we were able to expand our focus with uh, PhD students, uh, psychologists, last year. Uh, this year we have some additional programs available um, if, if legislation passes for master's level professionals, counselors, social workers, etc. But we really want to increase our focus, um, in, like I say, into the nursing arena as much as we possibly can. And so we hope that this webinar series is going to be a kickoff to lots more things to come. It's a big focus for us to do interprofessional training, uh, to do um, as much as we can with integrated care, uh, and that's something that we'll be talking about throughout the series. So uh, some of you may know that um, there's an increasing trend to incorporate behavioral health care into primary care offices. We're working a lot um, with that across the state. And so we hope that people that attend our trainings are not only uh, behavioral health professionals, but um, those that interact with uh, behavioral health professionals as well. We'll get out more information about uh, the six-part series. And as you can see here, we're hoping to touch on uh, several different large topic areas. And we'll be open to your feedback, too, that will help us shape uh, the presentations from here on out. Okay, Mary, thanks. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Connie Wallace, who is the president of the Nebraska chapter, the American Psychiatric Nurses Association. We've partnered with the APNA from Nebraska on this webinar and on the series. And we think it's going to be a great um, benefit to us to learn more about their organization and um, utilize all of the great connections that they have across the state. And uh, Connie has been a tremendous partner thus far. And um, I'd like to have you tell her, uh, have her tell you a little bit more about the organization. Oh, I think you're muted, Connie. Give her just one second there. At this time, we are having a technical difficulty with our one of our speakers, Connie Wallace. Give us a minute to resolve this a technical difficulty and we'll be right back in a second. All right. Do I have sound now? Yes, you are on, oh, Connie. Okay, Thank you. Okay, great. Well, that was just a momentary glitch, kind of like a station identification or something like that. Um, as, I, as I was saying here, this is about uh, the National Organization, American Psychiatric Nurses Association, and um, of course, the Nebraska chapter is a part of that, and um, we're really happy to be a part of this awesome opportunity to share with Beacon in reaching so many people. I'd also, just before I forget, like to thank you all for tuning in, even though I know there's a basketball uh, playoff going on, and might I just take a minute to say, go Blue Jays! Uh, with that, let's move on to our mission statement for uh, Nebraska's APNA. Next slide. Thank you. So the Nebraska chapter is, uh, our goal is to provide leadership to promote psychiatric uh, mental health nurses and to improve care across the state, uh, culturally diverse individuals, families, groups, um, and to work even in terms of shaping health policy. And I think we've seen some effects of that just recently with the um, legislature and, a and the APRNs. Um, in Nebraska, we have about well, the last I knew, at the end of the year, we had 85 nurses uh, who were members of APNA Nebraska. And our goal at the beginning of, of this year was to reach 100. And we are well on our way to reaching 100 right now. We're getting close, so that's awesome. The national organization of APNA has over 10,000 members. And so it is a strong organization. And if you're not a, a part of it, I'd really encourage you to check it out and um, join if you can. 
I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, our big event in Nebraska APNA, and that is the Spring Conference that's coming up in just two weeks. Thank you. It's on March 27th and will be held at um, Allegiant Creighton University Hospital here in Omaha um, and has some great topics. It's, uh, the title of the conference is It's All in the Family, and you can see by this slide that we've got some speakers that are touching on, on many things that are so pertinent to almost anybody. Genetic influences on psychological resilience, uh, mental illness and health during pregnancy. We have um, a national speaker from the um, Tourette Syndrome, National Tourette Syndrome Association coming in to speak about assessing and treating Tourette. We have um, a, a diversity and inclusion trainer uh, who will be talking about caring for transgender clients. And then we'll wrap up with an interactive case study uh, regarding psychiatric diagnoses by one of our um, own APRNs in Nebraska, Cindy Hayes. Uh, next slide. This is, this is our brochure. Um, so maybe some of you have seen it. Um, if not, you can see it on, online at www.apna.org slash Nebraska. So it tells you our conference is from 7.30 till 4. And while it is being held at uh, Creighton University here in Omaha in the basic conference room, it is being um, transmitted as well to um, Hastings, Lincoln, Scotts Bluff, North Platte, Valentine. Um, so we, we really are working, as is Beacon, to reach uh, all of Nebraska in promoting um, awareness and education for mental health issues and providing um, continuing education and support for uh, mental health uh, providers and mental health nurses. Um, so let's see. Let's go on to the next slide. Here we are. Um, at, the, at the end of this conference, you can see on our brochure that new this year is the opportunity to register for the conference online. And so that's being done through the National APNA um, organization, and the link is on the brochure. So um, you can see that in walk-ins, just as a cut and curl hair shop, walk-ins are welcome as well. Um, and if you've got any questions or want more information, you can contact me. Uh, my e email is uh, included as well. Um, so please, please consider um, coming and attending if you can and, and participating with APNA. We'd love to see you there. Uh, next slide. Thank you. We just want to talk briefly about the prevalence of mental illness in Nebraska. And this is a, this is a great slide. Uh, nearly everyone is familiar with the Huskers and Memorial Stadium. And um, together, our Nebraskans with mental illness would fill that stadium three times on a game day. And you know how full that stadium is. So um, one in five, that's um, basically 4.4%. And we, you know, basically that's, um, that's, enough so that it's easy to recognize that we probably all know someone who is dealing with mental, um, mental health concerns, whether it's a family member, a friend, a neighbor, um, ourselves. It's, it's really common enough that we need to be aware and we need to be ready to um, offer support and education. Um, with this Memorial Stadium slide, I love it because it um, also is included in the programs for the Huskers and for other sporting events, and it says don't be sidelined. And there's a great website to go to for that, and it talks about getting, getting health care and getting support. And when you think about college students, college age students, um, that's a prime time for mental illness to become apparent. So it's really timely uh, and appropriate that this be um, presented here, and I, I'm thankful for them for, for bringing it into public awareness. Okay, next slide. Um, here we're looking at the providers in Nebraska, and you can see we've got psychiatric prescribers and independent behavioral health professionals and others. Uh, this slide, however, does not specify all of the other people who are part of interdisciplinary collaboration in providing care and support for mental health consumers across the state. And um, we, we know that they're there and we know who we are, and that would include uh, nurses, RNs, um, psych board certified uh, psych mental health clinical nurse specialists, um, 
nurse techs, um, social work, RT, just all kinds. And um, it really does take a village to support individuals with mental illness. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's the rate of psychiatric pres prescribers, and that includes um, doctors and APRNs and, and physician assistants. And you can see that in a state like Nebraska, we really are spread out. There's uh, many in more urban areas, but there is such a large rural part of our um, state. And, um, and this really is why Beacon is such an important agency to be um, working with mental health care in Nebraska. I'd like to just comment briefly on that little red square that says uh, 3.0 to 3.9 per 10,000 which is a higher level of rate of prescribers right there, yeah. And as we were talking about it, uh, we realized that that was um, the region that would include Hastings. And of course, there's a regional center there. And there are many pr more prescribers there for that very reason. So this, um, this is something to keep in mind because it might not necessarily be providing care to specific community citizens at that at that time in that place. Um, but you can see that we're really spread out and that the further west we go, the fewer prescribers there are. Next. Next slide. At this time, we're going to conduct a poll about the information that you just saw. Um, you're going to see the blue box come to the front of your screen. And so, at this time, can you answer the question, how do you fit in the data that was just presented? You can click on the, the radio button that is um, relevant to you at this time. We will give approximately 30 or so seconds for your answers. And you will see this blue box until uh, the poll is closed. I see that we have people participating in our poll. And so be aware that this box will stay in place until the poll is closed. We're going to give you another, say, 10, 15 seconds to respond. And I'm not seeing any more responses coming in. Oh, we had one more there. We just need a few more of you to answer the poll question, if you can. All right, and at this time, I'm going to close the poll, and we can start screen sharing again. And just to comment on the poll, the poll results, we have 11% nurse practitioners that are specific to psych. We've got 5% uh, nurse practitioners in other specialties, 5% of psych RNs, 49% of RNs in other specialties, and the remaining 30% are in other specialties. And we... Whoops. Okay. So as you're looking, you can see that AP, uh, the Beacon, along with um, APA and A Nebraska, have been uh, working to, provide, to plan webinars, approximately one every other month, um, on various topics. And these are going to be, we're really happy to have Mary Moeller speaking tonight at our first, at our first um, session. That's so awesome. Uh, we'll be thanking you many times over, Mary. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Um, in the remaining months, we'll be having some uh, local experts throughout the state who will be talking about the topics who are listed here. Um, the date is yet to be determined, but we do have the months in place, and we've got um, a pretty diverse menu of um, presentations coming up within the next uh, year. Next. I like this slide. I'm not from Nebraska originally, so I'm always um, 
intrigued by looking at where people are from and again how large and spread out Nebraska is and what that means for our clients who are looking for mental health care and also for the uh, providers and caregivers for those clients. And so you can see once again that we've got some um, pretty, um, pretty scarce providers in some parts of the state and it's so important that Beacon has taken on the initiatives that they have in terms of trying to promote um, and educate professionals to respond to mental health needs across the whole state. And Connie, this is Mary. I believe that this slide is showing where the people who are attending tonight are located. <laughs> okay. Well, once again, <laughs> we're from all over the state, and that's great. And I, as I understand it, we also have um, some listeners tuning in from outside of Nebraska. Isn't that right, Mary? Yes, I believe so. I think Wyoming and Colorado and one person in California and one person in Washington, I believe. So that is great. Again, thank you for tuning in. Um, next. Okay, here we go. Another poll question. Right, and so we are going to conduct another poll at this time. It's really helpful for us to find out information about you out there who are listening to us. Again, um, you'll see that blue box pop up as soon as I launch this. And so please answer the poll question now. And I see that some of you are responding already, which is great. Thank you so much. And at the end of this poll, I'm going to be able to share this information with the group. You can see how everybody answered. So far, we have 86% of you that have voted. Thank you for that. And we still have some votes coming in. Just a few of you left to answer. I'm going to give you another, uh, another couple of seconds to answer. Okay. And at this time, I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. Mary, feel free to comment on these results. And when I you're ready? I can't see them. Okay, well, we have 16% that are in inpatient acute care. Outpatient primary care, we have 26%. Inpatient psychiatry, we have 5%. And outpatient psychiatry, we have 15%. And others and those that are not currently practicing, we have 39%. I'm going to hide the results, and at this time, you can continue to share the screen. Perfect. It takes us a minute to kick itself back in. There we go. Okay, so um, my name is Mary Moeller, and I'm originally from Blair. And so it's really fun to be able to interact and be part of my home state again. I have two grandsons in Omaha, so we get back there fairly frequently. And I'm now back in Washington State after having been in Connecticut for a while. So I am licensed as an ARNP and am teaching at Pacific Lutheran University where I'm the um, track coordinator for a developing DNP program for bachelors to uh, DNP for psych nurse practitioners. That's very exciting. And I'm attending at a 16-bed evaluation and treatment center, which is quite interesting. So tonight's programs, we have three objectives. And we thought, when we, we had a lot of fun doing the planning for this talk. Uh, we thought that we would set the, the framework for this. And I know that these are being recorded so people can go and listen to them again. And they can be accessible to other folks um, for in-services for your agencies. So this is a, the framework from which the other uh, webinars will bounce off of. So tonight we're going to talk a lot about terminology. And I really want to define uh, uh, the difference between mental health, mental illness, and behavioral health. Because we have a lot of uh, words that are flying around related to our specialty. We're going to talk a little bit about epidemiology of mental health and mental illness. And then we're going to look at a paradigm for assessment of these three clusters of symptoms, looking at mental health issues versus mental illness issues versus 
behavioral health um, concerns. And hopefully it will ground everybody in assessment. So I want to talk with a little history. I'm a, I'm a big history nut because if we don't know where we came from, then we don't know how to get out of the mess that we're in. And as case, you know, it's just as bad in Washington State as it is in Nebraska. Actually, we tied for last with Alabama for access to acute care um, services. Um, it, 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 so it's, it's just as bad where I am. So we want to know how did we get from you know, locking people up for their lives and putting people on show in hospitals and in France, they would sell tickets for people to, for citizens to come observe folks in uh, quote unquote lunatic asylums. And here we have the infamous Dr. Walter Freeman who um, developed the what was called the ice pick lobotomy in 1936. The very first lobotomy was actually um, performed in 1935 um, in Portugal. And that was Dr. Antonio Igas Moniz, who actually got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1949 for creating lobotomy. Well, Freeman did not want to have to drill holes in people's heads or cut open their skulls, so he invented um, this called transorbital lobotomy, and the first one was done on a Kansas woman, actually. A uh, little bit of trivia there for you. And what they did was um, put the person unconscious using uh, electroconvulsive therapy and then take literally an ice pick and insert it transorbitally uh, above the eye socket. And when it got to the orbit, they pounded it in with a mallet and then moved it around and disrupted the frontal lobes. And that was thought to uh, be helpful in curing mental illness. Um, Dr. Freeman himself did 2,900 of these, and he was a showman when he did this. So there was you know, quite a bit of controversy around him. But the bulk of the lobotomies were uh, stopped in the early 50s when Thorazine came out. Uh, and Dr. Freeman performed his last one in 1967 because he, had, he did a third one on the same patient who died of a brain hemorrhage. So they took away his license and he said he couldn't do that anymore. So the total number of lobotomies in the United States between 40 and 50,000 um, over a period of about 10 years from the mid-40s to the mid-50s. And it's interesting that Germany and Japan had outlawed them long before the United States. So it's a, a very dark time in American history. Not that there were you know, some people that accidentally got a little bit of help, but it certainly was uh, not well controlled treatment. And this is a picture in France of a person who was having um, a dissociative um, experience and the doctor put her on show in front of the medical students. So I can only imagine what this woman's trauma history was, um, that she would just be in this total dissociative state. So then we moved into the civil rights movement in the 60s with the anti-psychiatry movement. And these are actually patients that really had a very legitimate concern in that a number of people had been hospitalized in state hospitals um, because their family members didn't like them, or a husband didn't like a wife, or vice versa. And also a number of people were misdiagnosed with having schizophrenia because they heard voices, when in effect these were trauma survivors and they were having auditory flashbacks, not auditory hallucinations. So they were given, you know, inordinate numbers of medications and locked away for years and Finally, when we started uh, listening to patients and the recovery movement started and patients started rebelling, uh, we did a little bit better job of accurate differential diagnosis. But it's still a problem today with you know, very rushed diagnostic procedures, oftentimes in emergency rooms, without a thorough assessment of trauma. And so when trauma is in the history of someone, it will complicate any other illness, including physical illnesses. And lastly on this slide, I have our resident psychiatrist, Tom Cruise, who was lecturing Matt Lauer on uh, anti-psychiatry from his um, Scientology perspective. So then we went to actually starting to take care of patients very humanely. And you may not know, but uh, psychiatric nursing in the, uh, up until 
the 50s and 60s in most places in the United States were uh, separately uh, educated. So they were called asylum trained nurses. They went to live in the state um, regional centers all across the country and they spent three years studying psychiatric nursing. But you have to realize that many of these um, institutions were the size of cities, two, three, four, five thousand, up to ten, eleven thousand in highly populated areas. So these um, state institutions had surgeries and you know full pharmacies and full primary care and uh, maternal child care OB. So nurses were originally trained outside of regular training schools in asylums. And then that all changed in the mid-60s um, under the influence of our dear godmother of psychiatric nursing, Hildegard Peplau, who um, revolutionized psychiatric nursing after World War II. She had been in England, and she worked very closely with Harry Stack Sullivan and learned a great deal about interpersonal relations um, in, in interpersonal therapy from Harry Stack Sullivan and she decided that she would bring this back to nursing and she had the audacity to suggest that psychiatric nurses could sit and talk to patients and that patients would actually talk back to the nurses and they could have a conversation. And prior to that, the nurses were not allowed to talk to the patients. They just administered the treatments and the cold wet packs and the sheet packs and medications and that kind of thing. So, Hildegard actually got fired from a couple of places because she was so radical that she was a driven woman and she changed psychiatric nursing with the publication of her book, Interpersonal Relations in Nursing, in 1952. And I still have my original one um, from my undergrad days, and it's a green hardback, and it's been reprinted now. And then we have the American Psychiatric Nurses Association, which formed in the late 80s. We now have over 10,000 members nationally, and we have the highest um, percentage of a given population as a member. For instance, there's only 4% of all RNs that belong to the ANA, but we have over 10% of all psychiatric nurses belong to the APNA. So if you haven't joined, please do so. The APNA is for all nurses and we would welcome you. I had the privilege of being president of the APNA um, in 2009 and 2010 and uh, changed my life. Uh, and um, my year revolves around going to the Clinical Psychopharm Institute in June and the annual meeting in October. So if you've never been to an APNA meeting, please go to APNA.org and learn what your professional nursing organization can do for you. So a little bit of um, quick history. Uh, we know that in the Middle Ages, we were looking very much at spiritual causes, demon possession, witches, witchcraft. Uh, and that um, finally went out of vogue, and we started to get into the Enlightenment, and there was uh, hospitals for people that acted strange. And the original one was called Bethlehem in Paris, and that's where Charles Dickens wrote about Bedlam. And that's where the name Bedlam comes from. Then we had a Dutch psychiatrist who um, invented the dunking chair and thought if you could just dunk people in barrels of water that it would calm them down. Well, they learned pretty quickly that, um, you know, maybe I'd better not uh, uh, act the way I was so I can get out of the dunking chair. So it's, it's probably the first crude behavioral modification that there was. Then we had Johan Weyer. Um, actually um, were found in the late 1600s, but written in the um, middle 1500s, and he really was uh, very much of a humanist. So then we had our period of enlightenment, and we had the first therapeutic milieu in which we really looked at perhaps the environment had something to do with the way people were acting, and that maybe we should get them fresh air and sunshine. And uh, Philippe Pinel, such a famous psychiatrist who unchained people at um, Salt Pierre Hospital. And then we had um, America started getting in on it, uh, particularly um, after the revolution. And we had um, you know, trauma related with the revolution. And much of what's happened in psychiatry has occurred after major wars, Civil War, World War I, World War II. So we started forming public institutions, which originally were very lovely asylums, and they were created not to protect society from the patient, but to protect the patient from society. Because recognizing very beneficent um, psychiatrists realized that these patients had a very difficult time um, interacting in public and in uh, staying in reality, and so if 
lovely grounds could be created and nurturing, um, these patients would get better. So they had lots of fine, um, you know, meals and different therapies and lots of exercise, very holistic. Um, but then they started getting crowded. And then it started having not well-trained people, and the institutions became the nightmares that were uncovered um, in the mid-1900s. So we had some famous people, Dorothea Dix, you might remember. She actually was a school teacher, and she got very involved in the Civil War and was taking care of um, soldiers. She actually um, was considered to be a, a type of a nurse, but she had done her public work prior to and during the Civil War where she was absolutely appalled when she found women with mental illness and children in barns and in jails and laying on filthy beds of straw. And she went on a mission in Pennsylvania to get people with mental illness out of jail. And we need her again because we now have four to one patients with mental illness in jails than we do in treatment facilities. And the largest inpatient unit in the United States is the Los Angeles County Jail. So we really need Dorothea Dix again. And she was really sort of the front runner to the creation of the um, original lovely state hospital grounds. Of course, Florence Nightingale, uh, we all know what she did for nursing and really brought in health and wellness and fresh air and sunshine. Linda Richards was the first trained nurse in the United States, and she was the person who created the nurse's notes. And she did a lot of work at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. And we, um, you know, hospitals all use a form of Linda Richards' work with our documentation. Okay, then psychiatrically, of course, we had Freud. I didn't put his picture up there because everybody knows him. Um, started looking at the fact that perhaps um, there was a subconscious or a psyche. Freud was actually a neurologist, and he was a counterpart of Aloysius Alzheimer. And Freud um, really believed that you could look in the brains of people with um, psychosis and anxiety and see something like Alzheimer could see with the plaques and tangles with um, Alzheimer's disease. But that didn't happen. So then he started looking at the perhaps this is all functional as opposed to organic, and he kind of really went off the deep end as far as I'm concerned in coming up with everything related to sexual repression, which was quite um, actually representative of what was going on culturally in Vienna and Germany at the time, and I could talk a lot about that. But anyway, Freud did give us a vocabulary, and his work on defense mechanisms um, remains brilliant today and we use those terms, but uh, we certainly know that he had actually sold out on women and uh, created the Oedipal and the Electra complex as a way to legitimize incest. And so in his work on anxiety, he discovered that incest was a bad thing and created a lot of anxiety for women, and they shouldn't do that, but it was sort of the norm in the culture at the time and the Vienna Inner Circle said if he published that, he would run, they would run him out of town. And so he created the Oedipus and the Electra complexes to cover it up. So we're still swimming out from underneath that um, approach to uh, mental health. So Clifford Beers um, is this young man here. Clifford Beers was a Yale student. And he graduated from Yale in um, the early 1900s. And he was a Wall Street financier. And he had bipolar disorder. He decided he was going to jump off of a building and fly. Well, he was hospitalized at Connecticut um, Valley Hospital and for a couple of years. And he got better. He's one of these folks that had remission. And he was so appalled at how um, treatment occurred that he wrote his famous book called The Mind That Found Itself. And that was published in 1909 and started actually today's mental health movement. So we can thank Clifford Beers. Uh, he was the one that uh, his original organization turned into the National Mental Health Association. And the Liberty Bell, which is their emblem, is actually a bell that was cast as a replica of the Liberty Bell. But it was made from shackles that had been um, taken from state hospitals as a result of his work. So over in Europe, uh, Eugene Boiler. Uh, was a Swiss psychiatrist who actually gave us Boiler's four A's, and he identified schizophrenia as something that occurred young and was a dementia, and there wasn't very much hope for schizophrenia. 
uh, and his counterpart, Emil Kraepelin, identified, well, you know, there was something different besides dementia praecox, there was manic depression. So those two were working side by side in Europe, giving us some di early diagnostic criteria. They were also counterparts with Carl Jaspers, who did a lot of work with delusions. Uh, so we had a, a lot of good things happening about 100 years ago. So we fast forward to World War II, and so many soldiers came back with shell shock, which was coined out after World War I. And the government formed the Mental Health Act of 1946 and created the National Institute of Mental Health. And at that point, they were recruiting nurses to work with these soldiers. They really hadn't identified yet what PTSD was, but uh, knew that there was some phenomena there. The National League for Nursing identified that it had to be special training for psych mental health nursing in all nursing schools, not just asylum trained nurses. Then we had Peplow write her book, and at the same time, for the first time, psychiatric nursing was required now on state board exams. So that was huge, because prior to that, as I said earlier, psych nurses were educated um, only in asylums. So Peplow, who did a lot of her early work in New Jersey, actually got a master's degree in psychiatric nursing created at Rutgers, and she was the one who came up with the term clinical nurse specialist. So the very first master's degree in all of nursing was the psychiatric clinical nurse specialist. At that same time, Thorazine was um, released uh, for uh, treatment of positive symptoms of schizophrenia and revolutionized, uh, emptied out a lot of the state hospitals, which of course to communities that weren't prepared. And that was the, the beginnings actually of the mess that we're in now. And then um, six years later, the very first PhD in nursing also was in psych, and that was from Boston University. So there was a lot happening out on the East Coast um, related to moving our specialty forward. So that's a little history. And where are we today? Today we are with complete knowledge that mental illness symptoms are rooted in neurobiological processes, um, anatomical um, changes, that these are brain disorders. And brain disorders, we're going to talk a lot about now for the rest of this time, the brain does five things for us. And any one or all of those can be, um, can go wrong, can have problems. So depending upon uh, how much stress we're under, what's happening neurobiologically, what's happening in our genes, uh, we can have problems go wrong in our brain, just like we can have problems go wrong in our lungs and our hearts and our livers and our kidneys. So the National Institute of Mental Health has a lot of brain scans available that we can see, and we can see differences, tremendous differences in different disorders. Now I want you to, to know that you cannot diagnose mental illness from one of these scans. These scans are, are static, they are a cross-section, they're a one-time look at a, a given patient. However, these, uh, many of them have been normed, and so they're representative of people who exhibit certain diagnostic symptom clusters. So you can kind of get a real hunch, it's pretty much what depression looks like, what OCD looks like, what schizophrenia looks like, all done by scans. So I want us to have our first little neurobiology lesson here tonight by looking at what's been discovered with changes in the cortex. Now, the human cortex has six layers to it. When we're born, um, uh, four are mature, but two aren't. So a full third of the brain does not mature um, until around ages two or three. And you'll know when all six layers are up and running when the little child has speech that involves a subject, a verb, and a predicate. So not just the child that says ball, but the child that says me want ball. Then you know that cortex is up and running. The bottom three layers um, interact with inside the brain and with feedback loops coming from the body. And the top three layers interact with the external environment. So both of these um, uh, feed, feed loops, external and internal, um, meet in the cortical regions and transmit information. So we're looking at orange as the highest activity. So we're looking at normal. We see a very active cortex, in particular, um, the external uh, uh, feedback. So the brain is always on duty here, checking out our environment. What is it, you know, what do I need to know about my environment? When we look at bipolar disorder, we see some very uh, deficient cortex functioning. 
So the individual bipolar disorder often makes um, very um, bad choices, um, but thinks, you know, they can fly, they have all the money in the world, um, can tell their bosses to, you know, go jump in the lake because they know more. And that's because this cortex is just not online. And the importance of trying to help people with this particular disorder be on their medications so we can keep their brain functioning well. Unipolar disorder is quite interesting. We see um, a little deficiency in the outer layers, but we see a lot in the inner layers. So what we see similarities here between unipolar and bipolar, but the body is not relaying information to the cortex. So what's happening is a person with unipolar disorder, they don't experience hunger, they lose weight, they um, become very vegetative. Um, have sleep disruption or sleep a lot, and they can't get their cortex organized to be able to um, do their normal activities of daily living. So unipolar is very serious, um, as these all are, but they do have strong cortex um, problems. So this, you know, looking at this scan lets us see that, you know, if we're trying to plan care for this patient or somebody comes into your primary care clinic or wherever it is you're working and they have symptoms of major depression, you know, think, you know, reflect back on this picture and go, okay, you know what, it's not that this person isn't trying. This person's brain isn't working for them. And we don't have good medication. I mean, we do have good medications, but they only work for about a third of, to a half of people, and it takes six to eight weeks. And so people, you know, suffer a lot while they're getting adjusted on medications as well. Then when we look at schizophrenia, we see a very interesting pattern. We see changes in the external feed um, but not quite so much with the internal feed. What we know about schizophrenia now, however, is there's deficits in certain areas of the cortex, in particular the prefrontal, but also what we know is there's a loss of white matter connection in schizophrenia. So the cortex can, you know, work basically not too bad. I mean, there's some deficits here, but the feedback coming from inside the body is very, um, uh, it's erroneous. So people get sensory stimulation visually, auditorily, and that's what their cortex gets. It gets erroneous information. So that's what we know is going on in hallucinations. And then people will form judgments around that that are erroneous because the information feed has been inaccurate. So that's where we get delusions. So we see here that these disorders have strong cortex components. We also know we've got some anatomical changes. So if we're looking at a, an MRI from the front, so here's the person's nose. So this would be the right hemisphere, this would be the left hemisphere, this would be our third ventricle. We've got our frontal lobes, we've got our prefrontal, and we have our temporal lobes here. So right in here are our emotional circuits, right in here is our judgment circuits, and right over here is our cause and effect reasoning circuits. So we need all of these, um, you know, systems to be interacting with each other in order to accurately make decisions and have good cause and effect reasoning. Look at this patient with schizophrenia. I wish I could see your faces as you look at this because obviously we have enlarged ventricles, we have atrophy, severe atrophy in the frontal and the prefrontal and in our temporal regions. So people with schizophrenia, they're going to have delusions. They're going to have very poor judgment, which is coming right out of here, and particularly and for this patient, their right prefrontal. They're going to have emotional dysregulation because of atrophy in the temporal lobes. So we don't have medicine that gives brain cells back. And one of the things that we know, which is um, a passion of mine, is that every single psychotic episode that we have destroys more white matter. And the more white matter that's destroyed, the more symptoms a patient is going to have. So those of us that are in, the, in an area where we can do early case finding and early intervention will help patients down the road, will help actually save their brains. So when we think about lack of access to care and what the repercussions of that are, I mean, it, it's really pretty profound. I mean, it borders on malpractice, thinking that, you know, we're going to let a patient be in a psychotic state because they want to be, because it's their quote unquote right. So when we start looking at advocating for patients and helping them be able to have informed consent, we need to really consider the fact 
that every episode causes more destruction of brain cells and do all we can to get people in early treatment. Okay, now this is looking at the brain from the back. So here we have the right hemispheres over here and the left. So here's frontal, um, prefrontal, and temporal. There's our ventricles. Now look at, this is a patient, this was a Vietnam um, era patient that had post-traumatic stress disorder with psychotic features. So the question is, what did this soldier look like before he went to war? How much of this is the effect of excessive cortisol and adrenaline, uh, which we know are very toxic to the brain and toxic to brain structures, in particular hippocampus, which is located down in here. And so we start getting memory problems. And we compare that to schizophrenia, there's actually more deterioration in this particular soldier than there is in this patient with schizophrenia when we look at the posterior view of the brain. So again, this helps us have empathy and an understanding of what these patients are going through. Okay, now we're going to look at a PET scan. So uh, before we were looking at structure through um, MRI, and here we're looking at PET, which is telling us um, glucose uptake. So we're looking at, this would be as if you took my brain off and you were looking up at the bottom. So this is called a um, horizontal slice. So here's frontal, prefrontal, temporal. But this shows us internal structures. This is a thalamus. And all incoming sensory information goes first to the thalamus. And then it is fed up through the basal ganglia, which are right here, up to the frontal lobe. So all incoming sensory information, with the exception of um, smell, goes directly to the thalamus. And smell goes directly to amygdala, which is down in this area. So you get rapid response to smell stimuli. And look at the deterioration in schizophrenia. So again, we see the enlarged ventricles here. In fact, this, there's so much fluid in this ventricle that the um, uh, scanning device couldn't even bounce off of that ventricle. And we see real deficit here in the thalamus, in the basal ganglia, in the frontal, and the prefrontal as far as glucose uptake. So this means that this brain is not functioning efficiently. This is a patient who's off medications. Medication helps a little bit. But what we see here, the green means the structures are there. Yellow means they're ready to receive an impulse. And red means it's receiving an impulse. So this brain is very deficient in not only the structures that can receive impulse, but those that are actually receiving. So again, this patient is probably going to have a very difficult time ever living on their own and will need 24-hour care and some type of supervision. And that's not their fault. It's not their family's fault. It's not poor nursing care's fault. It's an illness. And looking at depression, we see a similar type of PET scan. We have thalamus, frontal, prefrontal. But look at this poor patient with depression. It just looks depressed. We call it blue brain. I encourage you to print these out. They're all from the um, NIMH, so there's not a copyright infringement. Print these out and show them to your patients. This patient with depression, this is really serious because good news and bad news about depression. Good news is that it'll get better whether you treat it or not. The bad news is how long it will take. So the basic blueness, which is deficit state in this brain, is 9 to 48 months after therapeutic response to medications. So you've got this patient, get them on an antidepressant, and you know sometimes behavioral health care says, oh no, you know, after nine months you have to go off your medicine, and the patient relapses again, and now they have a new 9 to 48 month episode. So even though our antidepressants are not perfect by any means, they're better than nothing. And they really are helpful for the, the brain. But this patient will need a lot of cheerleading, coaching, and ongoing support because the very chemicals that the antidepressants are trying to beef up are being used to run your heart, lung, liver, kidney, and make decisions and problem solve. So people with major depression have a dickens of a time trying to make a decision. Look at this frontal lobe. I mean, you know, they can't make a decision. So you'll, you'll listen to moms with major depression, and they'll sit there and they'll say, oh, you know, I can see that my kids are hungry. I can see that the house is a mess and the laundry's piled up. I can't do anything about it. And so it becomes very difficult um, to learn to manage this illness without understanding the severity of uh, the deficit state of depression. This shows a obsessive compulsive disorder. 
And we can certainly see where uh, why this person would be maybe washing their hands too much or counting or doing lots of checking and just trying to get this shut down is very difficult. We have our course medication treatments for OCD. Um, the SSRIs are somewhat useful, but this is a, um, a problem of basal ganglia. And in the feedback loop system where um, if you think your hands are dirty and you wash them and you've got this particular disorder, you wash your hands and the information that goes back to the frontal lobe is that they're dirtier after you wash them than before you started. So then the patient washes their hands and washes their hands and washes their hands. And the best treatment at this point is a behavioral override um, as opposed to medications. But OCD is a very serious illness. Now I'm going to give you my famous why I hate benzodiazepines. Okay. So those of you who are in primary care, please, I hope that you will pay attention to this. So we're looking here at the electrical functioning of the brain, and we've got the frontal lobe over here, and we've got the occipital lobe here. So we're looking at the four major brain waves, alpha, theta, delta, beta. Alpha waves have to be present in the occipital region in order to take in new information visually. And 75% of our incoming sensory data is visual. So it's very critical that we have alpha waves here. And uh, they're, they're waves that are about um, 18 to 32 cycles per second. Theta waves are in yellow. They're here in the um, parietal lobe. And theta waves are what we need for normal REM, REM sleep. Delta waves are right across that motor strip area and a little bit of the sensory strip in here. And delta waves are an abnormal wave. They're quite slow waves. But that's what we need to get into deep relaxation and to self-soothe. The bulk of the wave in our brain are beta waves. They're very fast um, uh, cycling brain waves. And they're present over the frontal and prefrontal. So you look at this slide of this patient, and we really see a problem. Obviously, there's no alpha waves. There's no theta waves. So we've got the motor strip pretty paralyzed, but yet thoughts are racing really fast. But there's a disconnect between the hemisphere so what we know this is, is a panic state. Now people always ask the question, how does a person in a panic state get put into a scanner? So this was a UCLA study done probably 25 years ago, and they would never get it through an IRB right now. But they discovered that if you are inject IV lactic acid, you can induce a panic attack. So college students will do anything for money. So some students at UCLA signed up, and they got in a scanner, and they got injected with lactic acid, and they went into a panic state. So thank heaven they did that so we could see what it looks like. So you have somebody who comes into an ER, they're in a panic state, or they, you know, they come into the clinic, and they're absolutely just out of control with panic and anxiety, and you think, oh, wow, all right. Well, you can't live like this is miserable. So in an acute, urgent state, we can use a benzo. But we don't want to be on them longer than what it still says, which is 14 days, not 14 years, because that is what a benzodiazepine does to the brain. So we've got the brain waves restored, but in the wrong place. So what's put to sleep here is the frontal lobe. And, you know, so people don't, they're numb. Their feelings are numb. They don't have to worry about their anxiety. So, you know, if you're in an ER situation, you want to give somebody, you know, a little bit of, you know, lorazepam, but you want to start them on an SSRI, uh, or, if, you know, try to figure out what may be inducing the panic. But this is the way the brain is on a benzodiazepine. So what we're doing is setting people up for state-dependent learning, which means that if they're not on their benzo, they can't recall anything that they've learned, and so then people get addicted, and then they run out of their benzos, or they saw them on the street, or something like that, and then they call in and they're in another panic. So use them, please, very judiciously. They're not meant to be taken more than 14 days, and they were created, Roche Pharmaceutical created diazepam, and the purpose was to create amnesia. So benzodiazepines are referred to as amnestic agents, and they're meant to numb people out um, in an acute tragedy, so the effect of it, you know, a death or a car accident or a storm or something, um, isn't so hard on the patient. Not to be taken every day. Okay, 
So that's a little bit about our structure. We've got a little bit of function related to neurotransmitters. These are the ones that our, our medications are working on, serotonin and norepinephrine, serotonin related to sort of mood and calming down. Norepinephrine is our sort of Paul Revere neurotransmitter, gives us energy. Epinephrine is adrenaline, it happens in crisis. Dopamine is for thinking. Acetylcholine is for our muscles, balances out our dopamine. Glutamate and GABA are in every single neuron. Glutamate is our excitatory um, neurotransmitter, and GABA is our inhibitory. So Valium, for instance, is natural GABA. Glutamate gets turned on with PCP. So too much glutamate can give you psychosis, but not enough glutamate can give you depression. So we now know that we have people taking ketamine for depression, but if you gave that uh, person with schizophrenia ketamine, you would give them psychosis. So we're learning lots and lots and lots of all the neurotransmitters, and everything seems to be pointing to gl uh, glutamate um, as the real upstream regulator. So you're going to be seeing a lot related to that in the next few years. Okay. And at this time, Mary, I'm going to stop you because we are going to do a poll at this point. Mm -hmm. If you can stop sharing your screen, I will make the poll right, active. Sorry about that. We are going to ask you about the information that you just learned, and I'm going to launch the question here. You'll see the blue box. Um, how much did you know about the information presented about brain functioning that you just saw? If you could go ahead and answer this question using uh, your cursor, that would be great. Uh, the answers are not much. Some of it, most of it, I could have taught it. <laughs> And so far, nobody has answered that one, Mary. <laughs> okay. We'll give people a chance. We've got 84% of people who have already answered the question. We'll give a few more seconds here. Great. I don't see any more answers coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and then share the results. Mary, I'll read the results for you, okay. but the audience will be able to see this. Okay. So 39% said not much at all, 44% said some of it, 17% uh, said most of it, but nobody could have taught it, Mary. Okay, that's <laughs> so all right. at this point, I'll hide that, and you can go ahead and share your screen again. Okay, doke. <clears throat> well, this takes a little while for that to kick back in. Excel. Hmm. I don't know what that is from at all. What happened? Okay. There. All right. Something happens when it goes back on the screen share. Okay, so this is a website that I'm not going to take the time to click on, but I wanted you to have it. It's from the New York Times, and they're absolutely outstanding podcasts about these uh, individuals who are living with mental illness. So again, they'd be very helpful for in-servicing and trying to you know, get a little bit more uh, face on mental illness. I have my students listen to these, and they have to post them on a discussion board, and it, it's quite amazing how it helps reduce stigma. Okay, um, the World Health Organization looked at mental illness, are you ready for this, for the first time in 2002. Before that, no studies have been done on mental illness. There was an update done um, in 2010, and what they came up with was uh, what are called dailies, which are disability-adjusted life years, which means the amount of time that somebody loses the disability plus time lost to premature mortality. And we know that people with schizophrenia die 20 years younger um, than their cohort. Uh, in 1990, schizophrenia was ninth out of all diseases. They rated, I think it was about 475 illnesses, including um, car accidents and falls. So they looked at everything that people would die from. And it's still ninth out of all diseases as a huge burden of illness. But um, what they identified that 10% of the population, of course now we know 10% of the population is 700, uh, 700 million because we've got 7 billion on the planet, but that that accounts for a third of all years with disability. So when we look at these years, um, uh, excuse me, these disorders, 
major depression is number one. It still is number one, and they're predicting it to remain number one. Followed by heart disease, stroke, alcohol, diabetes, schizophrenia, bipolar, lung cancer, and Alzheimer's. Some of these switched a little bit in the 2010 survey, but we look at one, two, three, four, five, six of these relate to the brain. So that pretty much goes without saying. Okay, so I found this cute little graphic that there's a myth that I don't know anybody with mental illness when in fact someone you do know or love has experienced mental illness. So we know that 57% of Americans know somebody who's been diagnosed with mental illness. One out of five adults, as we saw in our earlier graphic, one in every four families has a member with mental illness, one in every five children or adolescents, but only a third of these are getting help. Children's mental health services are a mess in our country. One out of every 14 jailmates and two-thirds of older nursing home residents. So no matter where you go, where you work, um, you will be working with someone with mental illness. So we see these statistics. Uh, the most common is major depression, um, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar, panic, OCD, schizophrenia, dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's thought that 14% of people have dissociative states, not in a full dissociative disorder. So we've got post-traumatic stress disorder, um, phobias, anorexia, using drugs. Um, we know that about 7.3% you know, are substance dependent. We know that almost 20% of adults, young adults, are current drug users and about the same report binge drinking. So we've got a lot of troubled people. So what is mental illness? Okay. I don't like the word mental illness. I don't like the word behavioral uh, health. Um, I like to use the word illness of mental functions. So and I also like to use the word psychiatry, which is a branch of medicine referring to the brain. So we've got this problem with people saying, oh, it's a mental health issue, it's a mental health issue. Well, maybe it is. Okay, so how are we going to define these? I like to look at mental health issues. Every single one of us has mental health needs. We have a need to feel safe and secure, um, to be able to manage your anxiety, to be able to have an even keel mood. So we all have mental health problems. There are a number of P or mental health issues concerns, but there are a number of people who have, have problems with mental health that's not a psychiatric illness. So people are anxious because of the economy. That doesn't mean they have an anxiety disorder. People are sad because they're losing their jobs or losing their homes. That doesn't mean it's major depression. So we have to be very careful when we're seeing patients that we are looking at, is this a mental health issue that is pretty doggone legitimate? Um, or there's trauma and abuse happening in the family, and this kid is acting out um, because he's afraid to go home after school because there's alcoholism and abuse in the household. So his behaviors would be normal given what he's facing. So I really want you to think about your use of vocabulary here and that mental health needs are common. The families get upset. It's not psychiatric, that's not behavioral, they're upset. And just because they're upset doesn't mean we're going to label that and diagnose that. So we have a problem with vocabulary because you know, we have things that are depressing, but it doesn't mean we have depression. We have things that are anxiety producing, but it doesn't mean we have panic states and anxiety disorders. We have things that are upsetting. It doesn't mean that we you know, have an aggression disorder. So we have to watch and look at what is the etiology. So behavioral health got borrowed by psychiatry um, when uh, there was a bringing together of psychiatric and substance use treatment. For the, the bulk of our country, there was you know, a split. So you had a, a mental health department, and you had a department of substance abuse. So they refer to themselves as behavioral health because they were looking at the behaviors associated with drug abuse. And they were over here doing their thing, and psychiatry and mental health were over here doing their thing. That's why our specialty is called psychiatric mental health, because we differentiate what becomes psychiatric, meaning we can have you know, severe dysfunction and inability to um, accomplish our normal ADLs, um, versus behavioral health. Well, now they got merged, and the behavioral health people 
didn't want to be called psychiatric. And the psychiatric people said, well, you know, um, we're still going to use psychiatric, but if you want to call it behavioral health, that's fine. So now the word behavioral health has gotten lumped in to cover everything, psychiatric and mental health, and it's just not the case. So be careful with your terminology. And what we are looking at, what the field is moving to, is psychiatric and substance use disorders. And, you know, but you're still going to see behavioral health units, behavioral health, you know, disorders, behavioral health concerns. But you really want to define what is that. Are you talking about a psychiatric issue, a mental health issue, or a substance use issue, or maybe all of the above? So we have five things. Our brain does five things. That's it. So it perceives, and this happens through our cranial nerves, that our 12 cranial nerves that feed in um, from the external environment as well as our internal environment. And so I'm going to cover these linearly, even though they happen very um, um, abstractly. So we have perceptual functioning. When that goes awry, we can get hallucinations. We can get illusions. Cognition. So you perceive something, so then your brain has to do something with it and you know, come up with a notion. So it has to think. So we can have cognitive disorders where people have poor judgment, or that can go all the way to delusion. So then based on what you're seeing and hearing and what you're thinking, you're going to get a feeling about it. So you're going to have an emotion. So you're going to feel you know, happy, sad, glad, mad, afraid. Then based on what you feel, you're going to respond. So behavior is really looking at a response to perception, cognition, and emotion. And finally, based on that, you're going to either interact with people or you're going to avoid people. So it affects our socialization and our relationships. So this is what I ask you to frame when you're looking at patients. You know, are there perceptual dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction, emotional, behavioral, socialization? But unfortunately, our society zeroes in on behavior. Oh, their behavior is bad, or their behavior is inappropriate, or they're behaviorally acting out. And if you just judge that, without looking at the perception, cognition, and emotion that led to that behavior, we're going to get it wrong. Trust me, we will get it wrong. I wish I had time to go into stories about people that were judged behaviorally inappropriate related to hallucinations, and when you find out what their hallucination is, their behavior is actually pretty altruistic. Okay, so looking at these a little more closely, so we're looking at interpreting our sensory input, we're looking at thinking, memory, problem solving, our feelings, um, and also in addition to responses and actions, behavior also refers to speech and it refers to motor movements. So behavior takes in medically language, actions, responses, and then as I mentioned earlier, social function is our societal functioning. So we have two ways that we think, primarily. We think abstractly and we think concretely. So we're looking at can people inductively and deductively reason? Can they make predictions? And we do that because we can remember and say, oh yeah, if I do this today, that's going to be a consequence tomorrow, which then gives us cause and effect reasoning. That goes aberrant when there's a psychotic disorder or a depressive disorder or a strong anxiety disorder. So then people end up thinking more concretely. And so when people have problems with concrete thinking, um, they can't do multiple stage commands. So if you say your schedule for today is A, B, C, the patient usually hears C. And they don't um, take into account A and B. They have problems with time. They won't be able to tell time. Um, will be late. Will miss things. Certainly can't manage money. And we'll see people with psychotic disorders that spend all their SSI check in, you know, three or four days. And they have a very difficult time with the English language. I remember asking one patient, how are you feeling? And he looks at me really strange. I said, well, I feel fine. And I said, well, tell me what that word means to you. And he, you know, rubbed his hand on his arm. He says, my feeling is fine. So we really have to, again, look at how people use language as well. So just some specific areas under each of these is in perception, we're looking at our senses, the pain recognition, pain assessment is very important, knowing right from left, proprioception is the relationship of your body in time and space, so we see a lot of clumsiness, particularly with psychosis, um, problems distinguishing sounds, and getting confused between foreground and background noise, patients can't sort that out. 
So a lot of times that's why they don't go to group therapy. Cognitive, we're looking at our um, kind of the business, um, information business in our brain. So looking at judgment, orientation, memory, etc. And then how we talk. Can we understand the words of others and can others understand our words, expressive and receptive? Is the content logical? Is it organized? And do people um, know names? Can they, can they come up with the names of words? So we're also looking at decision making, problem solving, abstract concrete, cognitive mapping. Cognitive mapping is being able to find your way around. So it's like when you go to an airport for the first time, you're kind of lost, but then when you go back, you remember your way around. That's cognitive mapping. And I think when they first designed mental health centers, they did that on purpose to confuse people. <laughs> we're also looking at motivation and the ability to maintain attention. So within this also, we are looking at how people talk. So we have this word called formal thought disorder, but formal thought disorder actually means the way that you talk. So are you talking in going off in all these details of circumstances? Is it loose? Are you making up new words? Are you just having linking words together that make no sense? Are you doing a lot of rhyming? Is it illogical? Is it tangential? So emotionally, we're looking at the ability to appropriately experience and express pleasure, displeasure, and loss. And so we have a lot of people who have difficulty with that. They can have anhedonia with depression. And then looking at our behavior and movements, do people act appropriately, responding appropriately to internal and external stimuli? Can they do their ADLs? Can they follow directions? Can they initiate movements? Can they maintain balance, have normal gross and fine motor movements? And does it correlate with stimuli? So those are all the areas globally to assess related to those core five brain functions. Um, finishing up with socialization, with being able to act appropriately, form relationships that are cooperative and interdependent. And this is a big difficulty for people with bipolar disorder, major depression, and schizophrenia. They misinterpret nonverbal behaviors of others. And they, they look at us and they can get frightened. And I, I remember I had one patient saying, you look like you're mad at me, Mary. And I said, really? And so, I went to the mirror and I said, oh, that's my thinking look. And so, you know, luckily the patient, uh, you know, was able to tell me that. And so I, I became very conscious that I tried to keep my face neutral when I was trying to think about, you know, how I wanted to respond to the patient or their medication or whatever. Okay, so my last slide here is then to put this all together. So we have our sensory input. We have external from those top three layers of the brain, internal from those middle, uh, under, underneath layers. We're looking at um, the ability to use our perceptions. And then we had to do something with that. So people have to process this information. They have to discriminate where is this sensory stuff coming from. They have to perceive accurately you know, uh, their place in the world. What are the feedback loops? Is this person, you know, forgetting things, misjudging things, problems with memory, decision making is faulty. Uh, in cognition, a couple of areas that I like to assess that I didn't put on a slide um, are when we're looking at executive function, um, besides planning, organizing, evaluating, and revising, one of, there's two functions that people who have um, mental illness often have difficulty with, and that's called set maintenance and set shifting. So set maintenance is when you're doing a task, somebody interrupts you, you can go um, do that, but you can get right back to what you were doing. People with ADD have a, a very difficult time with set maintenance. Um, set um, uh, shifting that is the ability to do one task, completely go do another task um, for maybe hours, and then come back and finish what you were doing. So our people have difficulty with set maintenance and set shifting. And then finally, we get an output. So this is good old systems theory, input, throughput, output. And here we have our five functions of the brain. So in looking at, then, if you're just going to evaluate behavior, you're going to miss a whole bunch of what's probably going on in that person's brain, in their life. We don't know what their mental health issues are that they're living with in addition to psychiatric and perhaps substance use. 
So with this, my time is up, and we'd like to take a couple of questions, if we, you have some. And um, do you have any questions related to your current clinical practice that might relate to this topic um, that maybe either Connie or I could answer, or you could get some referrals from Beacon? But we have a few minutes here, about 10 minutes or so, to um, wrap up. So I thank you all for your attention. and. Hope that this gives you a framework to go into the next um, webinars with. Thank you. This is Heidi, and thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Mary. Uh, there was so much information presented there. I'm sure that many in our audience are uh, processing it at this time, but there is a request for you to share a short story you had mentioned back when when you were going over the five functions of the brain that you had many stories of instances where uh, the, the, five, the, uh, the five processes of the brain were not considered in making a diagnosis of somebody. So do you have a short story that you could share that would demonstrate that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the patients that I was taking care of at our clinic out in uh, eastern Washington um, had been diagnosed as having bipolar disorder. Um, she was at a rock concert in um, another state and went into a complete manic state and was taken by a group of her friends to the ER. And there was a moonlighting dermatologist who diagnosed her with bipolar disorder, put her on lithium, and uh, she never had another manic episode. Well, she ended up with um, just deteriorating. This girl had a master's degree. She had taught special ed. And by the time I saw her, she was homeless on the streets, um, a mess, uh, and uh, on probation. So after working with her and really doing a thorough assessment, I said, well, what else were you taking when you were at that rock concert? Well, she had really bad asthma. And she had been on steroids. And she got into cocaine. So you mix cocaine and steroids, and you get mania but it's not bipolar disorder. So she really lost 15 years of her life, and plus when I checked her thyroid, her thyroid was completely fried out, we, and she had some, some really, some, some brain damage from that. So in looking at her, and as, as I was clicking through, you know, cognition, perception, emotion, behavior, and her history, and she'd been so successful and had this master's degree and was, you know, teaching in Montessori, and it's like, this is not a bipolar kind of thing. It's not, it didn't add up. So after we peeled all those layers back and just started working at, at accurate differential diagnosis, it really made a difference for her. And we were able to get her record expunged, and she got married, and she's, she's doing really quite well. Um, but, it, you know, it was, it, it was, it was heartbreaking to, to see her. So that's one that comes into my mind. Another one is a man that, um, this was a story that I learned from a woman in Oklahoma when I was down at Oklahoma NAMI um, many years ago. This woman's husband had schizophrenia. She had three sons, two with schizophrenia and one with bipolar, so really bad genetic load. But she knew her sons really well. She was an itty-bitty little lady, and she knew her sons would never hurt her. And all of a sudden, one day, her son comes up to her, and he picks up his chair, and he's taking this chair, and it looks like he's going to hear it with the chair. And she was standing up in the living room. She said, so she sat down on the couch. She said, son, put down the chair. Put down the chair. I said, no, mom. And he was coming at her. And she goes, son, why are you trying to kill me with this chair? And he put the chair down, and he said, oh, mom, it's not you. It's all those monsters behind you. So he was having visual hallucinations of his mother, who was very close to, um, that she was being attacked by these hallucinations. And so he was going to try to, you know, get rid of these monsters. And it turned out that there had been a similar situation when he was on an inpatient unit because he was going after one of the nurses who thought she had a really good relationship with him. And he ended up in seclusion and restraints. And, I mean, I get that. I understand because, you know, in that acute state, the nurse needed to, you know, protect herself. But the patient then um, didn't talk to the nursing staff for, you know, a couple of weeks. So it becomes really, um, you know, a judgment call 
you know, how much is being misperceived, what is this behavior indicating. I mean, one of the good things that Freud said is that all behavior has purposes, meaningful, and is goal-directed. And so when patients are acting on hallucinations and delusions, sometimes it can look like it's going to be very harmful, but in effect, it's very altruistic. So you're never going to know that at the time. It's only going to be afterwards when you're trying to, you know, rehash it and figure out what went wrong, and hopefully the patient will be able to explain to you what their experience was like. So those are the two that come to my mind. Dr. Muller, we have another interesting question that came in, and this um, goes back to when you were talking about the effects of different chemicals on the brain. The question is, how impactful do you feel unmitigated stress is in the early years of life on healthy brain development? This person works with children. Yeah, well, I mean, you answered your, your own question with your question. Um, the work of, if you want to really look at the authority on this, it's Marty Teicher, T-E-I-C-H-E-R. Um, Marty Teicher has devoted his life to studying the stress response in children and has really identified, um, you know, very negative consequences of, um, as you said, unmitigated stress. The cortisol um, is rampant. Uh, in these kids growing up, and it affects learning, it affects attention. Um, you know, Michael Rice did his, his famous study early years ago, 25 years ago, when we worked together in Spokane, um, looking at the effects of trauma and abuse on labor and delivery, and identified that um, women who'd experienced sexual abuse of some fashion had um, an eight-hour long average labor, and then their uh, delivery was either very precipitous or, or resulted in a section. Well, then they decided to study those children. So they got an IRB to do cortisol levels on the heel sticks for PKU with these newborn babes. And all these newborn babes were born hypercortisolemic. And so what our research is showing us now is that um, women who are in domestic violence situations, women who are um, in substance using situations, uh, very high stress, uh, pass that cortisol to the baby. And even if you get the mom out of that situation, but it's after the first trimester, because the uterus is an exocrine organ, it's, it continues to maintain that level of cortisol. So those kids are born quite differently. So in the same, you know, kind of on the same vein, you can take a child that's born into, you know, a, 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 a relatively normal family, and then something goes wrong, and there starts to be trauma in the household, uh, or this kid's bullied, um, and they're in, having a lot of stress. We know that that affects the hippocampus, and actually cortisol is toxic to the hippocampus and will affect memory and learning. The good news, however, is that if you get that child um, calm, where I always ask the question, do you feel safe more hours a day than you feel afraid, more days a week, more weeks a month? So if you can get people feeling safe more than they feel afraid, then cortisol levels will settle down and the hippocampus will regenerate. So there's some good news with Teicher's work. But these kids, they really do suffer. They really do. Thank you so much for answering that question. We have one minute left uh, to ask this very loaded question. Based on the history that you've presented, um, where do you see the future of psychiatric care going in the next 50 years? In the next 50? Well, I'd like to look at the next five. That's probably my lifespan. <laughs> um, I, I see that we'll go community-based where it was supposed to have gone. I mean, the Community Mental Health Center Act failed dismally. You need to know that when Kennedy passed that act in 1963, there was supposed to have been a mental health center built within a 50-mile radius of every citizen in the United States. So they needed to build about 1,500. Well, funding problems and misappropriations, um, they only built less than 700 of the mental health centers. They were all supposed to be built with two stories. And the second story was a relapse early intervention design. So that you go to the hall center, you're stressing out, you're having a relapse, you go right upstairs, 
to a crisis intervention unit um, in your community and you would get this, you know, uh, episode settled down. Well, of course, that didn't happen. By the time it got to the Midwest, most of our mental health centers were one story. And they were flat roofed, and I never understood why that was, and then I, I found out. And then, you know, they were on 10-year declining block grants. So what happened is after 10 years, the state was supposed to be totally self-sufficient in maintaining mental health center uh, upkeep and staffing, but many mental health centers, including several in Omaha, and one that I was at, um, privatized. Because when they got no more federal funds, they said, well, we're not going to take federal patients. And so, you know, Omaha used to have like five major community mental health centers, and they were down to Douglas County. And so there was a tremendous amount of um, misappropriation, not handling the money, not reporting right. So it's not that there hasn't been efforts at the federal and state levels to manage the care. But now, you know, the numbers have gotten so astronomically high and inpatient beds are so expensive that the care will be given in, you know, primary care settings, um, in integrated care settings, and hopefully we'll get more and more community-based where we can have community-based crisis uh, respite so we can help patients early access care before they get into a full-blown psychotic episode and lose more of their neurons. So I believe it will go community-based, and I think that nursing and advanced practice nurses are going to play a huge role in this in setting up practices. I also see a lot of telehealth um, and telemental health, and if any of you are interested in that, you know, um, Nebraska's got a really good system going, and many of the rural states do. So I see more being done telemental health where patients, you know, if they're out in Cherry County or somewhere, you know, can dial up and um, have a consult. And, I, you know, I see having um, an advanced practice psych nurse in primary care clinics that could, you know, help triage some of these people from home. So well, that that, thank you, Dr. Muller, that's definitely good news for our future. And yes. unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, to our listeners, please look forward to our follow-up email that will direct you to the information about how to receive credit for today's presentation and for other details concerning what we've seen today. Um, please, we do ask you to follow the link provided in that email as it will open up our evaluation and we do um, make changes and do take your suggestions uh, from that to make these presentations better for you. Um, I thank you in advance for doing that for us. So on behalf of the Behavioral Health Center of Nebraska, Dr. Mahler, President Connie Wallace of the APNA, and Amy Holmes of Beacon, thank you so much for joining us this evening. For those that were not able to attend, there will be an online uh, ability to watch this presentation as well. So look for that information. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.